Welcome to Cream, Eggs and Jam. A podcast for food nerds with show and tell by Elise Pulbrook and Scott Bagnell. We love to cook with cream, eggs and jam and learn from food people who give a damn. So join us for thoughts, tips and tricks with guests, recipes and more in the mix. Ah, hi, I'm Elise. And I'm Scott Bagnell. Welcome to episode one of our podcast, Cream, Eggs and Jam. It's so nice to have you with us and this is very exciting. Episode one, Scotty. I can't believe this. This has been a long time coming. We've been talking about this for ages and we're finally here. We're finally here. You might know us or you might be listening because you remember us from MasterChef season 13. Yes. And... I don't know, maybe you're listening because you're, you know, our, our super fan. You know, you know, maybe there's one out there. and <laughs> <laughs> um, Or maybe you're a family member. Thanks, Mum, for listening. Yes, <laughs> that's right. I think that will be a, a large proportion <laughs> of our audience base. But, you know, you mm-hmm, might also mm-hmm. be a food nerd like us. We love food and we love talking about food and cooking and making food and eating food. And so I think for me, this is a great way to connect with other food nerds and talk about the thing that we love. I also love talking about food, Scotty. I think for me, I can be really awkward with new people. And yes. as soon as we're talking about food, everything is fine. <laughs> I love that. I'm definitely someone that has been a, an extroverted introvert. Yes, um, yes. I'm very similar in that way, yeah. I think. And food food is that opportunity to relieve the, the, the pressures of social interactions you may otherwise find uh, intimidating. Food is something that connects us. Um, yep. You know, I'm an interior designer. I've been an interior designer for the past 22 years, specializing in commercial design, mainly hospitality and retail, which I love. And that's vastly different from your background. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, my professional background is in law. My undergrad was in journalism. So here we are on a podcast, actually maybe implementing some of those skills that were learnt once upon a time. Um, <laughs> my, my journalism course was very theoretical, Scotty. I went to yes. Melbourne Uni and uh, I don't know. I learnt a lot of theoretical information. <laughs> oh dear, practical skills. I don't know, not so much. And I, I've, I've felt that recently because I've been working as a chef and yes. one of the running jokes in the kitchen is that I've just spent most of my life in a library or like at a desk and like there are gaps in my knowledge because I've entered into an industry where people do apprenticeships and they have the training of absolutely every little thing. Mm. Um, you know, I haven't had that and compound that lack of experience um, in doing a chef's apprenticeship with being someone who has literally lived in a library. Um, <laughs> I, there, there are things that are probably common sense for some people that just don't come naturally to me because I'm a book person and, um, yeah, I'll, uh, think of examples and they'll come up along the way as we, we chat. <laughs> oh, I love this. I love this. Yeah. I'll, I'll save my humiliating conversations uh, for the listener to, to look forward to. I love this. I love this. Yeah. So mm. what are, today's episode, let's jump into that. We're going to do a yep. little bit of a, a, a discussion about the current episode of MasterChef, which is on Channel 10 at the moment. Scotty, I actually cannot really watch MasterChef. Um, so I haven't watched a full episode. I've watched bits and pieces. I've watched bits and pieces if it's been on the tally in the background. I got my nails done the other day and it was on at the beautician. So oh, nice, it was on, nice. um, it was on at dad's house. So I watched a bit there. Uh, I know what's going on because obviously we're both friends with Manoli. Yes. Um, <laughs> and there's also the, the, the segments that come up on social media. So, um, why I can't watch MasterChef, I think, is a larger conversation. <laughs> we'll well, save that for I, later. 
I was still addicted. I've been addicted mm-hmm. for 13 years, well, 14 years now. Um, so I am watching every episode. I love it so much. I think this season is so interesting with the fans versus the favourites. At the start, mm. I thought, oh, my goodness, this is going to be so unfair. Like the, the favourites have been through the competition. They know what to expect and they've been working in the industry, some of them for 13 years, Julie Goodwin, yeah. um, season one. But, you know, as I've been watching it this week, I've been fascinated by this process because I think the favourites are a little maybe stuck in their ways. They're used to doing things a particular way. They've been working in the industry Mm. and the MasterChef Kitchen just does not (laughs) work like that. It is like this whole new world. And um, so I think some of the favourites are becoming unstuck and, you know, the fans know the format. They've been studying the show. So they they sort of have a, a, a good idea of how to play the game and you can see that in some of the dishes that they're presenting. Mm. But it's very but interesting. don't you think the favourites have the experience of having played the game before? Like they, yes. they have been there, they have done that, they had gameplay that worked for them, that they've had the capacity to to trial in the past and True. what didn't work for them, they can go back and correct now. 100%, you're correct. What I'm wondering from you, Scotty, yes. is has there been a moment in an episode so far where you've completely related with a contestant? Has there been someone who you've related with because of a success or because of a, I don't know, a failure? Ah. <laughs> who have you felt for? Who have you <laughs> felt for and, and what did they what did they do? Oh, uh, look, I think um, I'm totally relating to all of the, the fans. You can see the stress and anxiety on their faces. Mm. Um, this, like, first week is so overwhelming. Like, just getting an understanding of the kitchen and how it works, it's so different from at home. You know, I'm cooking in my tiny little kitchen and everything's at arm's length. You're in this massive MasterChef studio and all of your utensils are on one end of the building and the pantry's at the other other end of the building and you've got cameras in your face it's a completely different format so you know I've been feeling a lot for all of those fans under this pressure and and, and you know everyone deals with stress in a different way some people yeah. are doing so well and others you can see um, are just trying to find their feet and I can definitely relate to that yeah absolutely oh and look the ones that struggle early tend to be the ones that win so yes you know, may that be a. Uh, uh, oh, look, maybe I should make a bet, Scotty. Oh, do we do we condone betting on this channel? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, no, bet no, no, responsibly. No, no. <laughs> nah, not at all. I, I think gambling is ridiculous. I don't understand <laughs> why humans do it. Um, it's yeah, it's toxic human behaviour. Yes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but I'm making a bet, um, and my bet is that, and this is for no nothing, like. Um, not yes. placing this bet on sports bet for no, the glory. Ugh, this is just <laughs> me making making an assumption or going on a gut feeling, and I'm going to say that I believe a fan will win. I think that they have more at stake. Mm. I think they're training harder earlier, and I think that will play off well for them. So that's my that's my bet official. Um, Very interesting. Obviously, we've got friends in the show, and we know producers. So. Um, you know, I'm making this bet without any information trickling on down through the um, yeah the sources. It's just my assumption. Master Chef hasn't even finished filming yet, so there is no winner. No, at, at the moment. Um, yeah, no. I mean, it would be nice for a favorite to win because you know, particularly a favorite who hasn't won before. <gasps> um, Could you imagine if a favorite won that's already won before? Oh my goodness! I reckon that's oh, totally not fair. I mean. <laughs> I'd be like, can you like donate some of your prize money to me? But yes, anyway. that's right. <laughs> you've already won 250k. Give it to someone else who hasn't realized their food dream. Um, I agree. <laughs> but that being said, if Billy won again, I would be like, oh my god, legend. Yes, yeah, she's I would be amazing, so happy isn't for her. she? And I, 
I would be happy for Sashi. I'd be happy for Julie as well. I mean, yes. everyone is so deserving in so many different respects and money is just money, whatever. But, um, you know, I can say that from my position of privilege, I suppose uh, there are things that I can't do because I don't have the money for it, but there are things that I can do because I do have the money for it. Here we are and we've bought microphones to record a podcast. <laughs> um, you know, yes. so I, I would love to see a winner who is is going to use the platform to achieve something that um, you know is of, of greater greater good than you know putting it towards a car you know there's there's yes. there's so much potential in the masterchef winnings and mm. the audience that you get um, that follow you after you've been on masterchef you know are food people and, you know, you can really tap into that audience and enjoy your life. Um, in anyway. Yes. I'll stop there. <laughs> I'll stop there with that. I could go on. So mm. wrapping up our MasterChef discussion, Sunday's elimination has only just happened and it was a Jaffle challenge to start off with. Uh, yes. I love a good Jaffle. What would be your signature MasterChef Jaffle? Oh. That's a hard question, Scotty. And and it's hard <laughs> because there are jaffles that I love to make and love to eat. But then if you are a MasterChef contestant, you also need to consider what is going to win? What yes. is a jaffle that the judges are going to love above all other jaffles in the room? What um, a question. And sometimes if you cook what you want to eat, you know, you do well. Yes. Um, so sometimes you have to just trust that what you want to eat is also what the judges want to eat. Um and if you start to muddy up your mind with, oh, what what are they wanting from me? Oh, yeah. Oh. That's the constant dilemma, isn't it, in that mm. MasterChef kitchen is second-guessing yourself and trying to figure out what you're making. And I think you're right. Mm. I think the, the best strategy is to cook something that you love and you know is good um, and the judges are going to love it too. Yeah. Anyway, our jaffles are not being served to the MasterChef judges. So you are asking me for my jaffle and I'm giving you my jaffle. It is just a cheese and corn jaffle, jaffle uh, jaffy. <laughs> 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 it's a cheese and corn jaffle and yum, yum. it's my favourite jaffle. I've grown up just having, you know, canned corn kernels and tasty cheese jaffles. I love corn. I love canned and corn. There's something about canned <laughs> corn. <laughs> I love it too. I oh. used to, I remember I wasn't even in primary school yet and I would <laughs> steal all of the canned corn from my auntie's pantry. Oh my she, she, she babysat me. I don't even know how old I was, but I've got this memory of being pre-primary school aged and opening cans of corn. Like while I was watching Barney the Dinosaur or something like that. Oh my God. And... I would open cans of corn, drink the liquid, I'd pour it into a glass, drink the liquid, and then just sit there with a spoon eating the corn Yum. without anyone knowing what I was doing. Like no I was judgment meant to just be watching me. a movie. <laughs> um, anyway, so I really love a cheese and corn jaffle that is just dirty canned mm. corn and tasty cheese. But to make it MasterChef worthy, I will say instead of buttering the outside of your toast, mm. um, use pesto. Oh, yum. Yes. Um, so the yes. grease of the olive oil and the pesto will create that crisp exterior, but with a little bit more flavour from the garlic and the pesto and obviously the basil. Mm, yum, yum, yum. Yum. Um, a little bit more texture there too, particularly if you've got some crunchy pistachios. So you've got that um, that outside of the jaffle now almost replicating like a um, delicious garlic bread. Yum. And inside the jaffle, uh, griddled corn. So not canned corn, let's take it up a notch and oh, okay. we'll, we'll do a corn that has been prepared, having been steamed and then um, griddled on the barbecue. So we've Yum. got a little bit of smoke, yes. um, a little bit of complexity there with the delicious juicy corn. Let's go yes. a little bit of char and my preference mm. of cheese would be a blend of yes. pecorino, Mozzarella, maybe a little bit of Fontina as well. Yum. Oh, I love Fontina. Mm, mm -hmm. In the in the breville, close the lid. That's <laughs> my that's my sound effect for a <laughs> jaffle. And 
then when you bite into it, you know, that stringy pulley cheese, griddled corn, yum, pops, yum, yum. the pops of corn and the juiciness of the pops of corn. Mm, yummy. So and the good. the aroma, like from the outside of the jaffle, just hitting you straight in the nose. With the yum. Pesto. Okay, that's my jaffle. I <laughs> love it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I want to eat. Oh, yum. I want to mm. eat that too. That sounds incredible. What's your jaffle? Ooh. Oh, you posted one. Yes. I, well, it was Anzac Day long weekend. And so I was inspired by one of my favorite biscuits, the Anzac biscuit. So mm. I transformed the Anzac biscuit into a jaffle. And can I tell you, it was divine. I took oh the God. flavors of that sort of caramel and coconut that you get from an Anzac biscuit, made a creme pat with mm. coconut cream, caramel, and set that in the fridge in a sheet. And then I sandwiched that in my Jaffa Lion, loads of butter, sugar, and rolled oats on the outside. So that all like caramelized, almost like the crust of a creme brulee. So you got this oh caramelized sugar and oat crust on the outside and you cut into it in the gooey <laughs> custard filling. It was so good. I was so surprised. It really did taste like an Anzac biscuit, but oh like better. Oh, my God. I want to eat this, but I don't know if I'm actually going to go to the effort of making it, Scotty. <laughs> Look, it wasn't too bad. It really wasn't. I reckon I did it under an hour. Easy. Oh, my God. There's something oh God. about the MasterChef kitchen and the experience for me that – has just everything I cook now is a time challenge and I seem to be able to cook anything <laughs> in 60 minutes. Oh, my God. I don't know what's happened. Mm -hmm. So my problem would be if I followed your recipe and, and made it, yeah, fine, sure, 60 minutes, but then I've got all the custard, all the crumble mixture, all the caramel, like all in the fridge ready for more jaffles and I wouldn't be able to stop. Oh, yeah, like, that is a problem. Particularly when it's convenient to put one together. Like I'm, I'm imagining this cheese and corn jaffle being made with some leftover barbecued corn, some pesto kicking around in the fridge. You know, I have a cheese drawer, whatever's in there. <laughs> you know, for your jaffle, you've made all of the elements especially for the jaffle. Oh, so yeah. there's that expectation that after you eat one, you'll eat another six. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> oh, and I yeah. don't see what the problem with that is. <laughs> Look, I... Uh, <laughs> I'm not an advocate for the diet industry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I'm still getting over our 100 cake experience. Oh, my God. That was a lot of sugar and butter. Oh. So if you don't know, last year, Scotty, Sabina and I made 100 cakes in 100 days. That was a journey. I haven't been the same. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I'm now addicted to sugar. <laughs> like I'm hoping this. Later. I'm hoping this podcast experience isn't as um, taxing on the hips. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm actually <laughs> going to the gym this afternoon, Scotty. I'm going oh. in. I'm, I'm. I'm. Yeah. I've rejoined. Well, not really. I've just got a seven day free trial. <laughs> 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 oh my god. Oh my no, gosh. I'm not an advocate for the diet industry, but I do believe in in healthy eating, healthy lifestyle. You know, life is long. Yes. Be kind to your body. Okay, I think we need to get into the next segment, show and tell, which I'm super excited about. Now, I don't know what you're going to show and you don't know what I'm going to show. Who's going to start it off? I think you should go first. <gasps> okay. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. look. I, like, changed my idea on this a number of times um, and this is probably a little bit random but that's what this show and tell is about. It's like mm. what is happening right now in your kitchen or yes. house or whatever. So, and it's my um, fault too, I think, because we were meant to record this yesterday but I had asthma and oh yeah, I don't so know. I'm just – I, I know you, Scotty, so if it's edible and you had to eat it yesterday, it's gone. I've already eaten yesterday's show and tell. You missed that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll have to do it another day. Uh, see, I thought that was something that I ruined. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I have I have a box. Ooh. So uh, for people playing along on the podcast, you can't see this, obviously, but this mm. is a box and I think you need to guess what's in the box. We need yes. like music. Like, doo -doo 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 -doo. So Scotty has a box that is l it's quite small. It's a brown box. It's taped shut from what I can see and... Oh, look, it, he's fitting it nicely in his hands. It's not huge. It probably is a similar size to like a tissue box maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I can tell you <clears> that <throat> my whole house smells like these at the moment. What? And it is divine. Oh. I need to make this into an air freshener. Really? It's so It's currently in season. This segment is turning into what's in the box. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, that's what this should be. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I want to know. Your whole house Have, smells like guess. it. Yep, my whole house smells like it. They're currently in season right now. In season? Mm-hmm. Mm. They have a very short season and this season has been very short. Am I going to guess or you think I'm not going to guess? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm going to pull something random from the atmosphere. Okay. Because I – so I recently smelled hops for the first time. Oh, okay. And – they reek. Like it's a beautiful smell. It smells like beer, but yes. they're really, really strong. The the plant hops that you yes. need for making beer and they're in season. Like they're being harvested now. Okay. And I'm off, right? I'm off. You, you cannot have hops in that box. No. no you are okay. incorrect. Ba-bom. I'm incorrect. <laughs> what I have here is... Oh, they, and if you didn't say they weren't hops and with the, with the fuzziness of the image, I would have been like, oh, they're hops. They are little green things. Lots they're of little green things green in this things. box. I know what they are. They start with an F. They do start with an F. And I would say their origin would be New Zealand. Yes. Is that correct? I have and two amazing friends, Dean and Celine from New mm-hmm. Zealand, and they dropped these off to me yesterday. Oh, yes. I'm so excited. Oh, wow. And are they like super, super oh. fresh and gooey? Like you can just like bite into it and it's ready to eat as they are? So good. Like these mm. probably could be a little bit gooier, but I don't mind them a bit tartar. And I don't know, like I just like eating the whole thing. I'm um, skin and all. I know some people like get rid of the skin, but mm. I like the tartiness of it. And they are like, I think, like to describe a fajoa to someone. Ah, the F word. There it is. <laughs> oh, have uh, we not said what they are? They we are fajoas. They are. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Mm-hmm. It is a fajoa. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are such an interesting fruit. I think they are so complex and beautiful. They sort of have like this almost like ripe banana, but then like passion fruit. They're so tropical. Mm. Um, They remind me a little bit of Monsterio Delicio. Have you ever had that? No. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's going to be my next show and tell. Monsterio (laughs) Delicio. It sounds like a spell from Harry Potter. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's going to be another show and tell. Make my dinner, Monsterio (laughs) Delicio. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, yeah. that's going to be another show and tell another day. We're yes, talking about please. fijoas today. Um, oh, okay, yeah, great. They're just still amazing. Giggle this. Oh. <laughs> still giggle this. Um, what are you going to do with all these fijoas? Well, I need, I need everyone's help. I'm, I'm not quite mm. sure. I'm like eating them because they're so mm. delicious. Yep. Um, I've made a zabione before, oh. and zabione and this go so well together. Because, like, there's something about that masala and the egg and the sugar and this tropical fruit that's creamy. Like, that combination is wild. Blah, blah, blah. What I'm hearing is you're making custard. (laughs) 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 If anyone... Okay, our podcast is named Cream, Eggs and Jam. What do you need to make custard? You need cream and eggs and, you know, jam is great. Jam is seasonal. We make... Like jam is seasonal because you make jam with with, with whatever is seasonal. You could make jam with fajoas. <laughs> Scotty Bagnall is a custard addict and I would call myself a custard addict also. I'm happy to <laughs> drink it from a carton. I'm happy to oh, yeah. drink it anywhere here or there. Sam, I am, you know, custard yep. every day of the week. Um, Zabayone. Yes. Is, is custard. So that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> no, it's not. It's done beyond <laughs> Oh, dear. Uh, beautiful. Uh, so, yes. No, Have I you made anything so. with fajoas before? No. I'm the kind of person who mm. 
will typically it's that's a fruit that I'll just demolish and eat mm, if I if yeah. I get my hands on some I suppose so Adam's mum and dad have a fajoa tree oh, nice. um, and if if I'm lucky to get any then yeah I'll have some I think um, Adam's dad has made a fajoa vodka. <gasps> Yeah. Hello. I need to. I'll. I'll, um, I'll send him a message and ask him because okay. that could be something that you could get on. Mm-hmm. I know that you like to make um, cocktails and infusing your own liqueurs is something that you can definitely do at yes. home. Um, like a fajoa cello. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It, it when you um, steep fruits into sharp liqueurs, you can mm. completely transform them. Um, I'm wondering also, Scotty, if you yes. had enough there to make a sorbet. And, I, and mm. I'm yes. not just saying this, say, like, oh, go make a boring old sorbet because you can make a sorbet out of anything. I'm, I'm mm. actually thinking about that sorbet that we had when we were contestants on MasterChef. Yeah. Um, that was a part of a taste test challenge with the chef from Nunu. <gasps> yes, that sorbet was incredible. What was it that? Was I still don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think no. any of us picked what the flavour of the sorbet was, but it was definitely a tropical fruit. I it guessed was. custard apple at the time. It had that same sort of flavour like a fajoa, didn't it? Absolutely. Ooh. Absolutely. And you could make that fajoa sorbet kind of replicate the context of that sorbet with a banana skin caramel. And Oh, Yes. Oh, there was, okay. there was so much in that dish that was just delicious. But oh, I amazing. love just a scoop of ice cream or a scoop of sorbet with like a jam or a – not like a really intense sugary jam, like mm-hmm. a very, very light. You know, you want to taste the flavour of the fruit or a caramel that's really, really punchy and forward with another flavour, like a pear mm, caramel yes. or, as I said, banana skin caramel. Yes. Um, and then something textural, so something crunchy. Yes. Um, a, a crumb, a milk crumb could be nice. With a little bit of Davidson yeah. plum. Milk crumb with Davidson plum could be nice. There's a little bit more acidity. Oh, my um, goodness. Okay, well, anyway. I've got my homework. <laughs> This is why we could talk about food all day. We're going on the tangents. Okay, it's your turn. Show and tell. Okay. (laughs) My my show and tell. Is it in a box? No. (laughs) (laughs) I can't. I mean, I could put it in a box, but I don't know if it would like being in a box. Oh, oh, so it's got a personality. It's a a a personality. It's a thing. Is it a chicken? I'm going to say it's a chicken. You know me. I love my animals. Yeah. This... Is an animal. Okay. And Scotty Bagnall, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, yeah, announced to the world yet, but um, I have an animal. Its <gasps> name is Coco Lamington. Coco Lamington. Of course it is. I'm oh, my goodness. Oh, I love the this animal already. This animal is not a, ch- not a chicken. It's not my a chicken? chickens. <sighs> I, have, I have chickens and their names are Poe, Nigella, Brigitte and um, Maggie. Um, this is Coco Lamington because she looks like a <laughs> Lamington girl. Hang on. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Baby. What is it going to be? It's a German <laughs> short-haired pointer. Oh, my goodness, it's a puppy dog. Yeah. Oh, she's only tiny and she's got floppy ears and yeah. a big brown face. And I can see where the Lamington inspiration has come from. Look at her coat. It's all, like, yes. spotted and like a Lamington. <gasps> she's my little Lamington, Miss Lamington. Oh, my goodness. So this is Coco, Scotty. Coco <laughs> is gorgeous. Yeah. Oh my god, she's, she's my amazing. Baby. And she is eight weeks. Um, yeah, we've only had her just over a week, really. Whoa. <laughs> oh my god, she's so cute. This is definitely a reason to uh, tune into our YouTube channel to get a load of this. <laughs> <laughs> she is amazing. How does Tibby feel about this? So I have another dog. His name is Tibby, everyone. And uh, Coco loves to grab Tibby's fluffy tail and give it a little bit of a pull. Um, Oh, dear. Tibby doesn't like that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, He's an old dog. So he's 13. He's a little fluffy Maltese Shih Tzu fluffy thing. Mm. Um, 
look, Tibby has privileges that Coco does not and won't have because she is a purpose dog. She will be a hunting dog. Um, Adam, uh, a part of his cultural background is that his family are – I'm going to put Coco back to bed. So, yeah, that was Coco. She will be a hunting dog and uh, particularly she'll be trained for flushing game birds – um, so I'm really looking forward to a future with lots of pheasant. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. She is adorable. <laughs> yes. So um, she is so smart. So smart. Wow. I'm really looking forward to having a, a smart dog. Um, Tibby is a very smart dog too, but he's more of a cat than a dog because oh. he just... <laughs> He likes to be walked and, you know, that's about as far as doggy behaviour as he goes. Yeah, fair enough. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Now, from our podcast, I would love to be able to um, not only just chat with you, Scotty, because we love to chat about food and and and, and things within the food world as they come up, Um it would be great to also interview people. Um, yes. And for our first podcast, how about we interview each other? Oh, I like this. This is a good mm-hmm. idea. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm ready. So in going into a little bit more detail about who we are, where we come from, what we've done with our lives, what we're doing now, um, let's make it a little bit of an interview format, shall we? Okay. Let's do okay. it. All right. So, Scotty. Yes. Why did you apply for MasterChef? Like, why that fateful decision that has brought us to where we are right now? <laughs> what a question. This is a question mm. I get asked a lot. Um, and oh, I think there's several facets to this answer. Um, mm. I've loved MasterChef since the very first season. And I don't know whether a lot of people know, but I applied for the very first season, season one oh. of MasterChef. And at the time I was an interior designer and I'd only just started in a fairly large architectural firm, living my dream job as an interior designer. And the MasterChef experience is full on. You basically have to give up your life for half a year, six, seven months, Um and so at the time, I I really wanted to do it, but I was being pulled in two different directions and I'd only just started my interior design degree so or my career as an interior designer. And so I thought, no, it's, it's not the right time. And since then, I've always thought about it. Um, and this season that I applied for was the first time in 13 years that I had the opportunity. I just started my own interior design business. So as my own boss, I didn't have to quit my job because I'd already done that. I'd already, um, been my own boss and started my own business. So I had that flexibility. Um, and it was also at a time where COVID had just happened. Um, so I'd lost quite a lot of clients because of COVID. I was in a of a state to try and decide what I wanted to do, whether I could Mm. still keep my business running or not. And this opportunity for MasterChef came up and I'm a big believer in the universe telling you to do something like something happens and it's a sign. And this was the the sign that um, I had to do it. Like the universe aligned and there was no reason that came up not to do it. And so I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, it's way outside my comfort zone. Um, I'm quite a private person and a bit of an introvert like yourself. So putting me into this public forum, what actually I didn't really even think about that side of things. I just loved the show. I loved cooking. I was so passionate about food and I was desperate to find other people that had that same passion. So I thought I'm going to give this a shot. I didn't think I would get in. I didn't think I would make it to, you know, the first episode. And so um, I auditioned and I got closer and closer. And then all of a sudden we're there like day one and I'm standing Mm. in a room filled with fellow food nerds um, surrounded by cameras going, what has just happened? Mm. uh, What I find really interesting is that this could have happened earlier for you. And yeah. I'm wondering when you reflect on your career as it's gone over the past 13 years, um, have, do you ever wonder how MasterChef could have changed things earlier? And on the flip side, like forward thinking, because we want to live in the, in the moment and the future. Yes, yes. 
like how has MasterChef changed your career now that you've you've done it? Like has it had mm. a bit of an impact on the trajectory of of what you do professionally? Yeah, well, look, I'm a big believer in no regrets. So, you know, looking back and thinking if I should have done it earlier, you know, I think um, there's no point in dwelling in the past. Mm -hmm. I think this was the right time. Like I have been a very successful interior designer for 22 years um, and I was at a point that I needed a new challenge. I think, you know, we like to challenge ourselves and do different things. And so I think the timing was right. But how it's changed my trajectory now is really interesting. I'm still, I thought it might have helped me decide between food and design because they're two of my biggest passions. And food has always been my hobby and design has been my career or my day job. Mm. Um, and I've been trying to combine these two things. And I'm still starting to work that out. But what I'm really finding is that I still want to do both. So mm. at the moment, I'm working on working out a way to combine those two things together. And restaurant design is something that I'm super passionate about. So it's something that I really want to focus on because I think that is the ultimate combination of my design skills and my passion for food and developing restaurants that focus on the food experience, I think is a really interesting niche to explore. And so I'm, I'm going down that road at the moment and I'm loving it. It's, it's very Heston Blumenthal-esque, may I oh, say. Oh, yes. Because he's all about how the external experience or how other aspects of the meal can influence the yes, flavour. Yes, yes. Um, you know, space matters. And I'm, I'm not it an interior does. designer, but like as far as I'm aware, because of my particular interest in Heston, you know, you're exactly the kind of person that I would want designing my restaurant because you – understand food, you understand flavour, you speak the language of a food person, but you are professionally an interior designer. Like, I, is there anyone else like you? I oh, don't I don't know. know. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I'm hoping, hopefully I've found that niche um, and it's yeah. definitely where my passion lies. So I'm excited. I'm so excited for you. What about you? I want to know why you. Um, same question. What oh, made yeah, yeah. you audition for MasterChef? Well, I originally auditioned in 2016. 2016, okay. sorry. Um, so that would have been the year Diana Chan won. Oh, um, wow. That was the year Otolenghi was first on. It was the year they went to Japan. <sighs> oh, um, no, you should have done it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Nigella was on. Like It was a season that I wish I was on. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's me living in the past, but no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make it through to the judges round. Um, I auditioned okay. and went through a few rounds. Um, the audition process was much different back then. Um, and then I, yeah, I made pasta. <laughs> of course I did. Um, two rounds in a row. Um, <laughs> oh my and one of the items of feedback was, you know, we need more from you. <laughs> oh, no. Anyway, flash forward, what, six years later? How many years has it yeah. been since 2016? Just about. Yep. Um, and I made pasta 12 times on MasterChef. <laughs> 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 oh, God, no, I didn't. I actually you're didn't. you're so good at it. People, people I seem to have like, accrued the... Um, the title of pasta queen uh, as of our season at least. And um, I didn't – like I, I know I made pasta and I probably made pasta four times but maybe five. I don't know. I should go back <laughs> and count. But out of like the 30 or so cooks, that didn't feel like a lot. Yes. Um, but, you know, I suppose when the edit's put together – a narrative is created around your character. Um, and um, Pasta Girl over here, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so what um, made you apply this year or last year? I actually didn't apply and mm. I received phone calls from producers who might have still had my contact details from when I applied in 2016. Um, you and I were both in that season where applications would have been put through during COVID lockdowns. Yes. Um, so I have no idea what was going on on the back end for them. But 
my application was from years ago. Um, and when I received the calls, like I say calls plural because I didn't take the first call seriously. I thought, oh, they're just doing ring arounds. Um, yeah. And they would have called like three times at least before I was like, well, I might act on this. Yeah. Um, I was also getting messages from friends and family just saying, Elise, this is perfect for you. Um, the judges are new. You're going to love them. Um, yes. You know, have you, um, you know, watched an episode with Melissa Leong? She's incredible. You need to be a contestant. Yeah. Um, and... Friends in the food industry, I had actually volunteered quite a bit in Melbourne and Australia's um, ethical and fair food industries and friends within food were telling me to try out too. So there's, um, yeah, a, a bit to be said when you're getting encouraged from from a few different angles. Um, and the next thing I knew I was actually a contestant. <laughs> so it, I, I don't want to sound ungrateful Um Particularly like watching this season or and knowing how much effort like Max has put in, for example. Yes. Um, you know, training. I was just going with the flow because when I applied in 2016, I went full on and I was practicing a lot. I was coming up with strategy and then I didn't get on. And that was a big time commitment. It was also a time where um, I didn't have a lot of um, – fancy equipment in my home kitchen and so I was uh, accumulating that back then like I bought an ice cream machine I brought an electric pressure cooker I was practicing master master chef cooks before even knowing if I would get on the show oh, wow. um, yeah uh, and then this time around I didn't practice because I thought I put so much time and effort into it last time and it went nowhere so I'm just going to see where I go how I go where I get to <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one uh, of my biggest regrets is not being prepared. Like I was the same. Like I went into mm. it not thinking about the competition, not having like dishes up my sleeve or have you know, really studied or worked out a game plan. I just went mm. because I love food and I loved oh, the show. And then it's absolutely. not until I got into the competition I'm like, oh, Oh right! Yeah. <laughs> I, I I should have I should have studied for this. <laughs> yeah, my first roommate was Therese, and she had notebooks of dishes that she oh, was wow. just waiting to pull out. Um, she was someone that stayed up late, like making twenty batches of shoe. You know, really refining <laughs> oh, her skills. Goodness. And yeah, I just felt like, oh my god, this is so much. You know, am I not doing enough? Um, but there's, you know, both you and I. We lasted the distance and it's not because of necessarily how much strategy we considered or the dishes that we had pre-prepared. I think that our vast experience of being cookbook addicts, being cooking show addicts, being people that have loved to be in the kitchen forever yes. um, is what put us in good stead. So there's yep. always preparation that you can do for competition and there's always – you know, a lot of um, natural um, ability that, that you already have that can be trusted. Um, and it's not that it's natural ability that's just come from nowhere. It's natural ability that's come from taking cookbooks to bed since the age of five. Like <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, there's, there's – so why did I apply for MasterChef? I didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, that was the question. Long-winded answer, but – I didn't. <laughs> I'm interested in knowing if MasterChef has changed your approach to food. And mm. let's talk maybe a little bit about our personal approach to food because I think that's something in this podcast, you know, we really want to try and interview food blazers in the industry doing amazing things and talk about their approach to food. Mm. And I think, you know, for me, the MasterChef journey has changed my approach to food a little bit and maybe focused it a little bit more. Did you have the same experience? Has, has MasterChef changed your approach to food? Yes mm. or no? And and then what is your approach to food is my yes question for you. No. Mm. <laughs> I would like to say well, it's always going to be yes but. Yeah. Right? It, nothing, yeah. nothing is ever yes or no. There's always grey area. And, <laughs> yes. Um, Hello, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 
it's um it's a very interesting question. So my background in law um, means that I've done a little bit of study in jurisprudence. And as a lawyer, you go into the industry with an understanding of a philosophy of law and um, the rule of law being this overarching structure that you are committed to. And um, it's, a, it's a theory of justice that you have as a practitioner. Um, and each practitioner might have a different theory of justice. And this is getting a little bit technical, but to maybe in simpler terms, I can explain it in the way a teacher might have a pedagogy. Yes. Um, so a lawyer's jurisprudence of their theory of practice is similar to a teacher's theory of practice in in the in a way that when they enter a classroom they have a pedagogy. They enter a classroom with a particular um, overarching belief system that um, their commitment to teaching is um, guided by, for example, um, positive psychology. Right? Mm. Um, you know, you could be a teacher that is about discipline and rules or you could be a teacher who is more interested in, in positive psychology and encouragement. Um, and you can obviously uh, be enthusiastic about both, but that's your pedagogy. You know? yes. And the balance that you strike is your is your theory of practice. And in food, I haven't come across a word. In law, there's jurisprudence. In no, teaching, there's pedagogy. There? And then in food, yeah, I haven't, haven't come across the word. But if I was to have a theory of food... Um, I don't think my overarching theory of food has changed at all. I think my relationship with food has changed it ha- or it ha- has gone through a little bit of a, an evolution experience. Mm. Um, my cooking has changed. and um, In what way has it changed? Oh, my, so what's the same is that I, I believe in food that is about togetherness, community, nourishment, um, I, I care about food sovereignty, food that is symbolic of where people come from, um, food that uh, is, is a part of expressing culture, heritage, background. Um, food can feed many hungers and I've always thought that. Um, that's what hasn't changed. What has changed has been, um, you know, I suppose the good things that have changed have been how I think about um, – uh, Native Australian ingredients um, and yes. their versatility and th- w- my passion for them um, has definitely been something that has has born from the MasterChef experience. Um, I love um, discovering um, – and, and I don't use the word discovering as saying like I'm the first person to ever experience it. It's just my personal discovering of new flavours, like being in primary school when I went to my friend Stephanie's house for the first time and ate her mum's Greek food. You know, that was an experience of discovery. I mm. remember being so excited by Delmatias and, and you know, vine leaves as a wrapper. Um, you know, similar yes. to how you can layer flavour with um, – anise myrtle, lemon myrtle, cinnamon myrtle and layer it with other spices and herbs and introduce native Australian Australian ingredients into spice mixes or blends um, or aromats um, for broths. Um, it's, I love that. I think, yeah. you know, we've had a similar journeys in that respect and my journey through MasterChef has also ignited this passion with native ingredients that mm. I sort of knew a little bit about. I'd skimmed around the edges and played with some before, um, but it really opened my eyes to the amazing world of native ingredients. Mm. And, you know, the lack of knowledge that we have, like these ingredients are around us everywhere and we're not taught about them. We don't – we're not taught about them in school. We don't know anything about them. Like even in the in my backyard, I have a blue Kwandong tree that I never knew was there. And there's what? amazing blue Kwandongs that are just there in my backyard. And, you know, I've probably walked past them a million times and it's not until MasterChef opened my eyes to these amazing ingredients – around us and you start looking and they're everywhere and you had Um, one in your backyard yes (laughs) oh my gosh oh wow and so yeah i think it's it's so exciting that they're an unusual flavor profile that we've just Mm. you know that's not in our repertoire it's not something that we're used to and you know for me it's 
exciting and unusual <laughs> ingredients are something I'm obsessed with. I just mm. love discovering new things. Yeah, the spotlight, I think, um, has been really enhanced um, in mm. recent seasons. Um, and, you know, that does a bit of good. It also starts that conversation of who is profiting off native ingredients in Australia, mm. um, how much of the market is owned um, by Indigenous people. Um, so there, that's a whole topic of discussion that I think that we should probably dedicate a whole podcast to. It's really, 100%. really um, – I mean, it's incredibly interesting for people who are um, into native ingredients but also as a, a social issue, um, there is a lot of imbalance and um, – it's a complex to, issue, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Scotty, in yes. terms of your personal f- approach to food around you, yes, do you feel like you have changed since how you were before MasterChef? Um, you know, you're <laughs> someone. I, I I know you love cookbooks, but I didn't. I don't know you from life before MasterChef. How did you cook? What? How did you feed people? What was your approach to food and cooking? Ooh, um, I have always approached cooking in a really creative way. I think there's something that resonates with me very strongly with design and food that have similarities in terms of you have a palette, you have a palette as in a set of tools Mm. as a designer that you use to create space. Um, And I think cooking is very similar. You know, your palette of ingredients Um, And the way that you combine those ingredients together to create amazing food experiences is something that I've always been obsessed with. Um, I, as you know, love my cookbooks. I love finding out about different cultures. Um, I think my... What really led me into this obsession with food and my journey as a food nerd is um, my final year of uni was the first time that I traveled overseas on a study tour to France and Spain. And it was the first time I grew up eating very simple food. Um, You know, our family didn't have a lot of money, but we loved food. Mum was an amazing cook. Um, And, but we would have, you know, bangers and mash and simple food, curried sausages, um, lamb chops with French onion soup, like sprinkled on them. It was one of my favorite things mum used to make. Obscure things that were just using cheap ingredients. I didn't grow Um, up like this. (laughs) (laughs) What do you you mean? (laughs) Traveling overseas. Was the super sauce or just a seasoning? Hang on. (laughs) I don't understand. <laughs> oh, it is the best. Just lamb chops and like a packet mix of dry like French onion soup. Ah, uh, okay. And you just sprinkle it over the top and cook it and the French onion soup <gasps> like absorbs all the juices of the lamb and creates this crust. <laughs> it is like the best. Okay. That's probably uh, another topic of conversation. <laughs> Sorry. I was just envisaging this lamb chop with like onions and sauce and I'm like, what? <laughs> It's my retro background in terms Uh of these obscure 80s, 90s retro food trends Mm. um, that have really informed a lot of my um, experience in the food world. But, yeah, as I was saying, when I went overseas, that opened my mind up to a whole Mm. world of um, food culture that I didn't know existed. I just sort of read about it and watched it in cooking shows, but to, you know, walk into a French bakery in the middle of Paris and buy a hot loaf of bread and mm. some fresh goat's breathe and smear it over the top. Um, yes. that was my first experience landing in the middle of Paris and having that crusty hot bread out of the oven with this incredible cheese, which I've never been able to find the same. Like that memory of that cheese, I can remember to this day exactly what it tastes like. Shall we go to Paris? (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) Episode two. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so that changed my mind. And then that's when I started to obsess with buying cookbooks, finding out about different cultures and food um, Mm -hmm. and finding out that there's so many different ways that you can use the same ingredient to create vastly different results. Oh, my God. You're (laughs) making me so hungry right now, (laughs) Steve. Oh, my gosh. Um, 
I'm actually like, well, maybe I need to go and make that javel. <laughs> 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 I've got so much basil in my garden. I have to make pesto anyway. Okay. Can I ask you what your, like, do you have a favorite cookbook or like a cookbook that you go to for your favorite recipes? <sighs> I hate it when people ask me this question oh, because sorry. it's like it's like choosing your favorite child. Like, what's what's your favorite book this week? <laughs> what's your favorite book My this favorite week? Favorite book, or book s- this selection week? Selection of books. What are you like? I know I generally have like a couple of books out at a time next to my bed. Yes, and like I'm like devouring them for like a good few weeks before they go back to the shelf. Yes. I guess, yeah. Are there? I mean. Who am I to ask you what's your favourite book? I also don't have a favourite. But (laughs) like what are you handling at the moment? My obsession at the moment is Nordic food. Um, I am obsessed. Um, I think that was one of the things from going through the MasterChef experience is trying to work out what my food heritage is, my food Mm. culture, because my food culture is like retro 80s (laughs) Women's Weekly and Country Women's Association (laughs) cooking, which didn't really translate into the MasterChef kitchen. Um, But in terms of my longer family heritage, I guess, um, I'm part Danish, part German, and then Irish and Scottish and my like four backgrounds. Mm. Um, and so I've been exploring this Danish side of my family heritage and it's something that really resonates with me a lot. I'm a big seafood eater and um, there's a lot of seafood in Danish cuisine. Um, so I have got two cookbooks at the moment, the Nordic cookbook, which I, which is like so thick, it's Mm. like five, six, seven centimeters thick. Um, and it's amazing. And there's another one called fire and ice, um, which is so good. Um, so they're the two ones that I'm. Are they both Magnus Nielsen books? Um, the first one is the Nordic cookbook is Magnus Nielsen. Mm-hmm, Love mm-hmm. him to bits. Um, and the second one I need to check the author on actually. Fire and Ice. It's a Faden book, isn't it? It's, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, I had the Magnus Nielsen one, mm. the Nordic cookbook, and I gave it away. And that's an what? expensive book to give away. How did you part with I'm it? I'm stupid, Scotty. I <laughs> give things. I'm like, oh, you would love this. Have my book. I'm, I'm like that a lot. I'm like, oh, you like my thing? Here, have my thing. And I, 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 I yeah, so I owned that one once. In 2016, I gave it away. I remember who I gave it to too. If you're listening, I hope you're enjoying that book. <laughs> <laughs> I just um, made the best yeah. stew out of that mm. book. Um, oh, really? Beautiful beef short ribs, just done so simply, like salt, pepper, allspice, dusted on the outside with flour and then cooked slowly in the oven with carrots and onions. It's Mm -hmm. pretty much all that's in it. And some juniper berries and some bay leaves. And it was divine. Like this stew was next level. Scotty, you are influencing me. I am getting in the car. I know exactly where to go. I'm going to go books for cooks. (laughs) (laughs) While I'm there, I'm getting myself some short ribs. <laughs> so good. Oh, I'm actually really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> what oh is your God. cookbook obsession mm-hmm. at the moment this well, week? One of them is currently being used to keep this microphone up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tartine's book number three. Ooh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And. Um, there's a new Tartine book, which is why I got my old Tartine book out. Anyway, the book that's in front of me, Tartine book number three, um, are the, I suppose, the complex bread recipes um, from the Tartine bakery in, in San Francisco. Yes. Um, like after their books number one and number two. So it kind <laughs> of there's a, there's a bit of a progression and the uh, exploration into grains and... Um, uh, flowers that aren't just your typical wheat varieties um, really gets delved into in Tartine's book number three. I made on the weekend from Tartine book number three their uh, chocolate rye tart. So the base of the tart is a chocolate rye sable. Um, So you get the earthiness from the rye into that biscuit crust um, 
It is not an overly sweet crust. I salt it. Um, a lot of American cookbooks I find don't add salt in desserts. Um, I yes. always – that's something that I deviate from in almost any recipe that I follow. I always season. Um, yep, same. Regardless of if it's sweet, savoury, whatever. Everything needs seasoning, a little bit of salt. Yes. If there is sugar, there must be salt. That is yes. the rule. Um, <laughs> and – this tart, Scotty, has a layer of apricot jam in the <sighs> recipe. The original recipe called for apricot jam, homemade. Yes. Yum. And then a – it's like a – I'm going to call it chocolate souffle filling. Oh, okay. But um, it's made with almond meal um, and it's Yum. aerated egg whites, melted chocolate, all folded together, really airy, delicious. Uh, it came like a – like a, like a uh, we ate it warm. So it was um, – very much uh, like a fondant filling. Oh my it god! Was it was crisp divine. on top, like crisp and firm. Yum! <laughs> and then the inside was gooey, gooey. And I actually didn't use apricot jam. I used homemade strawberry jam. <gasps> yeah. Yum! So it was a it was the tartine chocolate ride tart. But with oh strawberry God. jam instead of apricots, and it was gorgeous with some vanilla ice cream. Really <laughs> simple, um, vanilla ice cream. Like you always need to have vanilla ice cream in your in your freezer. Hundred percent. You never know when you're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm off to make a <laughs> fajoa and chocolate tart. I think, and you are going to go and buy short ribs. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> and, and a cookbook. <laughs> and a cookbook. <laughs> Yes. I think I need to buy a cookbook too. Yes. We would love to hear from everyone on what you're making. Mm-hmm. Um, give us your show and tell. Tell us what is inspiring you this week. Um, what are you cooking? What are you loving? What recipe books are you reading? And I reckon that is a wrap for our first podcast. What do you reckon? That's a wrap. Uh, join us next week for thoughts, tips and tricks. And how about some recipes? guests and more in the mix i love it (laughs) thank you so much for listening tune in next week for more cream Cream eggs eggs and and jam (laughs) you've been listening to cream eggs and jam i'm elise pulbrook and you can find me on instagram at elise underscore food person and i'm scott bagnall and you can find me on instagram at ss bagnall if you'd like to send us your show and tell, you can email us Scotty and Elise at gmail.com. Or if you'd like the visual experience of this podcast, you can find us on YouTube at Cream Eggs and Jam. Have a great day. Happy baking.